Luke 14, 25 to 35. Well, have you guys ever noticed that everybody is looking for us to make a commitment to something or to them? For example, whether it's your family or maybe your kid's school or the grocery store you go to or your gym or your job, even your church. Like for various reasons, everyone's looking for your devotion to them. It could be a financial reason that they want your devotion. It could be they want to reduce their competition by having more devotion uh, from you or, or a way to count on you. Lots of different reasons that people want you to make a commitment to them. Well, interestingly enough, God wants your allegiance too. But he wants your allegiance to him. And the thing is, unlike those, some of those other examples I just mentioned, it's not for his benefit, <laughs> It's for your benefit. And it's actually not only for your benefit, but also for other people that you come into contact with. And really, that's what our text is about today. I call this a greater commitment to Jesus Christ. A greater commitment to Jesus Christ. Because what he's going to do here for us is explain what a disciple is. Who is a disciple and who isn't a disciple. His desire is for us to commit ourselves fully to him. And then those are his uh, disciples. And we're going to be urged to actually count the cost of being one or count the cost of not being one. And this is a very interesting section of the Bible. And so Jesus is going to have us think about and apply three different things. And they are all about the subject of How can we have a greater commitment to Jesus Christ? In our outline, we're going to look at number one, in order to have a greater commitment to Jesus, that we would beware of other affections. Okay, we spend a little bit of time in that. And then secondly, we're urged to consider the consequences of this matter. And then third, lastly, we'll close with that we would desire to finish well. All right, so we'll start here in verse 25, and we're talking about a greater commitment to Jesus here in Luke 14. And number one in our outline is, uh, in order to do that, we want to beware of other affections, okay? So here we go. Verse 25, Luke said, now great multitudes went with Jesus. And I wanted to stop for just a moment because to bring you up to speed, to this point, Jesus has been teaching previously in chapter 14 that the invitation by God is sent out to everyone to come to this great festival of believers in heaven. That was the parable that Jesus just taught about last time that we covered. And so what we're supposed to understand it is that God is giving an opportunity for all people everywhere to receive eternal life. That's what he was emphasizing last time and that there's going to be lots of room in God's kingdom for people and anyone can go so long as we're willing to go on his terms, which is through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. And so that's what Jesus has been talking about in chapter 14. And so now lots of people there in that crowd are hearing that and they're starting to go with him. And that brings us up to to speed here. And we're told there in verse 25 that he turned to them. And this is what he said in verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. I have a couple of books in my library that cover difficult passages in the Bible. (laughs) Things like problem texts and hard sayings of Jesus and those kind of things. Well, this verse (laughs) is in both of those books. Because first read, it's a doozy, isn't it? And you're probably reading that going, wait a second, what did he just say? (laughs) Now to understand this verse, we need to do something first. I think you need to define the term disciple. (laughs) Disciple is simply this, a committed follower of Jesus Christ. That's it. Somebody who's devoted to him. Remember, as I said before, the previous section in Luke 14 is he gave the invitation to anyone to come to him and be saved. 
And then what the remarkable thing is here is the very next thing that he does is warn us about a shallow faith. And this, Jesus does this fairly regularly where he urges people to a greater commitment than, than we kind of would in the natural. But it's not an easy thing to do. It's not easy to follow Jesus because it's actually contrary to the way of the world. And so he says here, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sister, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, this verse is difficult because of two things. Number one, it says to hate your family, right? And then number two, it seems to contradict what we've been told elsewhere in the Bible, doesn't it? We know that the Bible teaches husbands... (laughs) to love our wives. That's the expectation, right? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, like a sacrificial love. We're told in the Bible uh, a number of times to honor our parents. (laughs) So in order to honor them, you have to have love for them. Um, We're actually told to love our enemies by Jesus himself, to not hate them. And so all that said, this can't literally mean to hate your family or else it would contradict scripture. So what is it then? Well, part of the challenge is that to us, love and hate are sort of on opposite ends of the spectrum. But to that culture, it was more like a continuum. It's like if you love something much more than another, by comparison, you would hate that thing. It's like in the Old Testament story of Jacob and and Rachel. Jacob actually had two wives, we're told, in the book of Genesis, Rachel and Leah. Jacob only really wanted Rachel. That's who he was in love with. But he was tricked into having both of the wives by their father, Laban. Jacob ended up marrying both of them. He didn't mistreat Leah. He took care of her, even though in the story, it's clear that he loves Rachel more than her. It actually tells us that, but he didn't mistreat Leah. And that's the same kind of Eastern uh, mindset in the, in the ancient world is that it would be a continuum or comparison. You know, Jesus did the best job of explaining what this means in uh, the gospel of Matthew. And it's in Matthew 10, 37. I wanted to show it to you. Look what it says uh, with me. Jesus said, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So you see what he's doing? It's the comparison. In other words, your love for Jesus has to exceed your love for anyone or anything else, or you can't be a disciple. That's what he just said. You see, the problem he's exposing is when family ties are more important to us than our relationship with him. And you know, it's fairly common because family is such a strong pull and it should, I mean, we should be devoted to our family, but he expects a greater commitment to him. Now, why is that? Well, because family ties can tend to violate the way a disciple is supposed to go. Family may not agree with what God says to someone in that family about how they're supposed to live. Or a family might think that a a, a Christian in their family is taking it too seriously. You know, can't you just chill out a little bit? You know, that kind of a thing. Sometimes the Lord is going one way And friends or family is going uh, another way. So which way are you going to go? Disciples are supposed to follow Jesus no matter what. You know, this is especially true if somebody is making you choose between them and Jesus Christ. For example, let's say a, a Christian woman, she should not let her husband's lack of interest in the Lord affect her own walk with him. If she wants to be a disciple. You know, some ladies become lukewarm to Jesus because their husbands are. You know, it's like they're not willing to pay the price. And again, you can kind of understand why that is. Maybe they want to keep the peace at home more or whatever. But that's not God's desire. He wants to be in first place all the time. 
You see, the natural way of thinking is if I put my wife first, kind of put her up on a pedestal, in a way worship her, then she will feel loved and we will have a good marriage. I mean, that's kind of the natural way that people think. When actually the way it works, if I love God above all things and first, then the product of that will be I will be the husband that my wife actually really needs. So the point is here, if you're going to follow Jesus, he has to be first above all other relationships. Also, did you note there in verse 26 that he said you're supposed to love him not more, only more than, than other people, but he says greater than your own life also. What does that mean? Well, that means more than loving your own way or more than loving your own desires or, or more than loving your own feeling. Somebody said instead of asking how everything affects us, Jesus wants us to ask how everything impacts the kingdom of God and his glory, you know, instead of other people. You know, I was thinking one way to illustrate this, and then I'll move on to the next verse. If you would, just maybe imagine with me that you're one of the first disciples of Jesus, you know, that small group that he had, and and you're walking around Israel with him 2,000 years ago, and and you're going where he goes, and you're talking to who he wanted to talk to. You're spending time in the places where he wanted to be. You're, you're sleeping outside. You're, you're eating what he ate. And, you know, you're just basically doing all the things that he did. And that's what the disciples did, right? Now, let's say at some point you decide that you're going to kind of veer off from that and go your own way. You know, you're going to start, well, yeah, I know what they're doing, but I'm going to organize my own plan. <laughs> I'm going to go to my own places. Uh, I'm going to focus on some other things. And, you know, you are free to do that. (laughs) But now, would you be one of his disciples any longer if that's what you did? I don't think so. It doesn't mean that you don't believe. It's just that in this example, you love your own way, your own life more than his life. And that's the point here that he's making. Well, he says in another way in verse 27, let's look at that together, would you? It says, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You know, in the Roman Empire, the cross was a symbol of death. If somebody was carrying a cross, the only thing that that meant is it was going to end in the death of that person. You know, like a, it's, it's just a one-way journey. That person is not coming back from that. And that's the uh, idea here. It's the same kind of idea in a spiritual sense. You know, it'd be like seeing somebody and going, you know what, that guy over there, he is sold out for Jesus and he's not coming back from that. You know, there's this expression some people use, he's ruined for Jesus (laughs) in a good way, ruined for Jesus. And that's the idea, not coming back from it. And notice again there in verse 27, he says, unless that happens, you what? You cannot be his disciple. You might think you are, but not according to him. You see, a disciple is someone who's committed to the cause of God's kingdom. And that's what he's trying to develop amongst the Christians. He also said there in verse 27 that we're to bear our own cross. Did you see that? It's your own cross. Now, yours might look different than mine. We have a sort of a customized walk with the Lord. And so the things that he has you to bear will probably be different than the things that I bear. But but here's one thing I know. I know that bearing my cross is not just putting up with stuff that I don't like. Chick-fil-A is closed on Sundays. It's just a cross I bear. (laughs) It's not that. It means to die to your own way. That's what he's talking about. Die to your own way and go his way instead. You see, the cross is a path of commitment. And not all believers will do this. You know, the best way that I can describe it is that it's sort of like a direction down a path. Because we don't arrive in this life. And nobody's talking about perfection here. But we're talking about a direction down his path where he's going. Again, using that visual of walking with Jesus through Israel as one of his 
disciples. So what that means is that if you, friend, are honestly seeking to deny yourself, if you're honestly endeavoring to love the Lord more than others or, or yourself, or and you're committed as much as you're able to the cause of the kingdom, then you're headed in that direction. Praise the Lord. And so he's not really talking to you. But if it's different, if it looks different than that, then there's the potential problem. And he's speaking to you. You know, let's just say if, if somebody is continually gossiping about others when God told us not to slander people. Or if somebody's looking at pornography when the scriptures say flee sexual immorality. Well, then those people in those examples have left the path of discipleship because that's not where Jesus is headed. So what I'm trying to say here, and I'll sum up our first part of the study. Many people think that they can follow Jesus apart from the death of self, and you can't. And that's why he tells us to do it. So our first part there, in order to make a greater commitment to Jesus, is he urged us to beware of other affections. And there's lots of them. And so maybe we could just like keep this in, in mind when it comes to family and ourself and friends. He wants to be greatest. So beware of other affections. Now, number two, uh, in order to make a greater commitment to Jesus, well, we're going to be urged to consider the consequences of that decision. So let's start here in verse 28. And here's what he said. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it. What he's going to do is tell two parables. And this first one is a little parable about building something. And in this case, it was a, a tower. Now, to you and I, it's kind of strange thing to think about building a tower. Lookout towers were very common then. They would put them in, say you owned a vineyard, they would build a tower in the middle of the vineyard so that they could keep an eye on things. Watch for animals or fires or thieves, whatever it is, and it was just a common thing. And so uh, he's talking about something to them that would have been an ordinary thing to see. You try and picture yourself being one of them and you're going to build a little tower on your farm. And so the question is, can I afford to do this, right? So then in verse 29, he says, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Jesus points out this person who's mocked. And why is he mocked? Because he's not able to finish what he started. In other words, the lesson here is seriously consider whether you can endure the consequences. I know a guy who told me that when he was a young man, he wanted to be in the ministry, pastor. And he was urged to read this book called Lectures to My Students by Charles Spurgeon. And, and it's a really good book that deals with a lot of the things that means to be called into pastoral ministry. And he told me that after he read it, he decided not to do it. <laughs> that the cost he could just see was going to be too great for him. So he never even took those steps. And that's the point that's being made here. Don't start something and then not finish because of the mocking <laughs> that comes with it. You know, if you uh, live here in the Treasure Valley, years ago, there was a big project in downtown Boise where a guy started to build a high-rise uh, building and then ran out of funding. And it sat there for years as just like this big partially completed hole in the ground. And he was sort of ridiculed in the community because of that situation there. And it's like what Jesus is talking about here. Started something that couldn't finish. So what is he trying to get us to understand as disciples? Well, I think it's this. If you think the world sees committed Christians negatively sometimes, it's nothing compared to half-hearted Christians. William McDonald said, The world has nothing but contempt for half-hearted Christians. And I think he's right. And, and the reason is because we're so inconsistent in the things we do and the things we say, and everybody knows it. And so Jesus is using this little parable, urging us to avoid that. He's like, count the cost by asking a question to yourself. 
can I afford to commit my life to it? He wants us to commit our life to it, but he wants us to think this through too. Well, he he gives another example here in verses 31 and 32. He says, or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000 or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. Okay, so remember the the question before that the parable taught was, can I afford to commit my life to this, right? Now the question is, can I afford not to? Can I afford not to commit? Can I afford not to follow Jesus with my whole life? And he uses a battle here. And it's a great analogy if you think about it. It's like he's saying, do you think that you can win the battles of life as a half-hearted Christian, you know, like serving in ministry. Do you think you can win those without being all in? Or a parent, you know, say you have several children and you're a Christian parent. Do you think you can win the battles that come with that without completely giving your life over to the Lord? Or maybe you're an employee with a worldly boss who's always like doing stuff that really gets you. Jesus, I picture it saying, look, are you just going to surrender to the enemy or are you going to be my disciple? (laughs) Boy, does that really get you thinking about how we're going to do this. Now, in case we haven't gotten the message yet, (laughs) there's verse 33. (laughs) So let's read this one together. He said, so likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Well, this is not one of the most popular verses in the Bible, is it? I mean, I've never seen this one on a bumper sticker. (laughs) He wants us, friend, to forsake everything for him. You see, those are the disciples. This would cover things like our possessions, maybe the things we buy, the things we own. A true disciple does not get to make all of those purchasing and ownership decisions on their own, is basically what this means. Like, let's say that somebody wants to make a particular purchase. That particular purchase may not be what God wants. And let's say, just for illustration here, that it's an expensive car, really expensive car. And that person who's a Christian says, you know what? I need a car and I want that one. And I don't care how much it costs. I'm get, I've am i dreamed of having that car and I'm going to get that car. And I don't care what it costs. Now, is that person free to do that? Well, of course they are, right? And I would say it's not really a sin to do something like that. But I'll tell you what. It might make it difficult to follow Jesus now because they've got this big monthly payment and they're they're shackled to this job now to pay for it for five years or whatever. And they can't be free to pursue what he's calling them to. And, you know, there's lots of examples of this kind of thing. And so the point I'm making is our personal decisions about our stuff and the things that we do affect our com- commitment to Jesus, or they can Did you see that phrase there? He said, forsake all that he has. That phrase in the original language is a say goodbye to. So maybe we could just imagine ourselves waving goodbye to anything that would get in the way of our greater commitment to Jesus. Because that's what he wants us to do. I'd like to go back with you uh, for a moment to the first verse we read, verse 25. And remember that many were going with him, right? He gave the offer. Now many are going with them. And he's asking them, do you know what this will mean for you if you follow me? Do you know what this means in your relationship with your family or your own way or the things that you want? When I was reading through this and preparing, I was trying to determine why this is so important for Jesus that we're committed disciples. I believe it's because it's for our benefit. (laughs) J.C. Riley, a teacher from uh, way back, he said, what you obtain by faith in Christ, you never lose. You see, you guys, God wants you to win this race, but it requires doing it his way. And part of that is being willing to forsake everything for his sake. You see, 
he's the chief building inspector. And he knows exactly how the Christian life is supposed to be built right. And he wants to help us. So we have to listen and trust him when it comes to our life and the things that we do and the things that we love and kind of thing. I know that we uh, sometimes can get discipleship and salvation kind of all mixed together. And so I want to explain the difference between salvation and what we've been talking about here today. You know, often some of us will describe our conversion like this. They'll say, I gave my life to Jesus 20 years ago. I gave my life to Jesus in 1991. We say it like that. Now, I get the phrase, but it's not exactly true (laughs) because he gave his life for you. You just accepted the gift. You see, the truth is he saved me. He did all the work. He made the sacrifice. I just believed. And so I say that because I don't believe that this section of scripture is talking about salvation at all. It's talking about after salvation. This is talking about your own personal commitment to your Savior. And if that's what you mean when you say, I gave my life to Christ back then, well then good. Good, if that's what you mean. But remember, my friend, salvation only happens once. (laughs) What he's talking about here is a daily commitment to him. Something that you give. You see... There's a difference between being a believer and being a disciple. All believers can be disciples. Not all believers are disciples. And that's why he's teaching this here. Henry Drummond, another teacher from long ago, when he was talking about being a disciple, he said this, the entrance fee into heaven costs you nothing. The annual subscription costs you everything. (laughs) And I think that gets the point across. When it comes to the things that we have, the things that we own, our possessions, you might want to remember here that when Jesus asks for it, disciples are supposed to give it to him. It might be something that you love, that you own, a possession of some sort, and he wants it. And so we're supposed to give him the keys to it. It might be a relationship that's not healthy for you, and you've been kind of fighting that. Well, when he asks for it, we're supposed to give it to him. Or it might be bitterness that we've been carrying around about someone for a long time. It might be your time. It just goes on and on. But when he asks for it, disciples give it. So consider the consequences. That's our second part here. Now, number three, and we're talking about making a greater commitment to Jesus. Now, number three, and this will be the shortest one, we're going to talk about uh, our desire to finish well. So if we want to make a greater commitment to Jesus, we should desire to finish well. And here's what he said. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? (laughs) Okay, so salt here is describing the disciples. (laughs) He said elsewhere, they're the salt of the earth. You see, the commitment to follow Jesus and the blessing of it is like adding salt to your dinner. (laughs) It really brings out the flavor And it creates a thirst and those kind of things. Part of the blessing of being a disciple is not just for our own benefit, but as I've said earlier, it's for others too. And and when we have this commitment to the Lord, other people are going to say, yes, I want that too. I want what she's got. I want what he has. I mean, that happened in my own life as a young Christian. And so therefore, the Lord is urging us to follow him like that until he calls us home, that we would finish that way well by being salty Christians. (laughs) The question now that we're going to finish with here is what if the salt isn't salty anymore? We'll look at verse 35 and we'll close with that one. He said, it is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, let me ask you this. What would saltless salt be useful for? Not much. So then we can surmise that a Christian who lives his life mostly for himself and focused on his own priorities and his own affections is like unsalty salt. Like, ah, that's what we're supposed to think when we read this because that's what it is. Notice there in verse 35, he said, men throw it out. 
Now, he didn't say that God throws it out, did he? (laughs) He's not saying that God rejects you if you can't commit like he's talking about here. But he is saying that people will mock because once a Christian has a foot in both worlds, he's really no good in either of them. (laughs) And so Jesus, because he's kind and gracious and he knows the big picture, he's urging us to devote ourselves to him. That's why he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. It's like, are you really listening to what I'm saying? (laughs) He's trying to convince us. And he's convincing me, and I hope he's convincing you. So maybe you could think about this with me a little bit. There's something in your life that's become more important than your relationship with Jesus. Friend, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, something that you have maybe, or something that you do, a career, whatever it is. What we're being urged here is, are you willing now to change and put him in front of that? You know, I would urge you to maybe pray about this over the next few days. You would think, seek the Lord. Is there something in my life that has its place before you, Lord? Ask him to help you make a decision about this. Ask him to help you count the cost. In my own heart and life, I'm trying to say, Lord, I want to love you more than anything else, anyone else. I want to love you more than myself and my possessions in my own way. And I would hope that's what we would all take away from this. You know, I was thinking might be kind of a fun thing to do is just use this as a quiz for you and I evaluate ourselves and and just do it like this. After you leave this study, seek the Lord and say, am I a disciple like he taught here or not? Just take a quiz, honestly evaluate that, or even better have someone you trust tell you if you are, you know, using the criteria that Jesus established Am I a disciple or not? We have these booklets at our church. We wrote these little booklets a while back called Discipleship. It's a, a, just a short read on what it means to be a disciple, what a disciple is, how to know the Lord personally, and then how to commit your life to him. And I wanted to read a, a little quote from them, and then I'll close. The quote from the booklet goes, The committed follower of Jesus learns to value what Jesus values, love what he loves, and hate what he hates. The committed follower of Jesus lives for the kingdom of God. That is the priority. (laughs) And to me, that's a really good summary. Even though I I wasn't the one who wrote that, I agree with that. And actually, this is a resource that we want to give to you. You know, we will post a link to this on Facebook. It's We actually are housing them on our website under the media tab uh, there. And you could, you could go and you can download it. If you don't have access to those things, you could contact our church office and we'll email. Well, just send an email to us and we'll get you a copy of our discipleship booklet and help you to grow in those things. Well, before we close in worship here, if what we've been talking about today is your desire, I would just ask you to seek the Lord, ask God to fill you with his power, fill you with his spirit so that you can make a daily commitment to do things like read your Bible and and pray earnestly and, and serve him and want to be in fellowship with others. Because as you put yourself on the path of commitment, he will, you'll have lots of opportunities, as he said, to take up your cross and follow him. Will you pray with me? Lord, I just pray for everyone that's listening to this message. And God, that you would minister to those who have been convicted by your word and that they would turn from the path of of just sort of half-hearted Christianity and put themselves completely at your will, Lord. I pray that we would just, as a church, that we would yield to you, Lord, and that you would help us, Lord, that we wouldn't be feel condemned, but we would feel uh, encouraged and hopeful that you desire to do a great work in our life now, and then that we will rejoice with you when we see you face to face and you say, well done, good and faithful servant. So we love you, God, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.